Good morning and welcome to the NGC Bocas LitFest panel on the topic of words and images. I'm sure many of you have covered one eye, covered the next one, and have realized that each one gives you a different view. But together, they give a deeper perception. Words and images function in a similar fashion. They give us two eyes, they give us two ways of seeing, two ways of reading, and we will be looking at those modes of perceiving and making sense of the world and exploring the relationships between them. And I have a wonderful panel of participants, and I'd like to introduce them. To my far left is Philip Nanton, who is a writer and spoken word performer from St. Vincent and the Grenadines who lives in Barbados. He has performed his work across the Caribbean and internationally. He has edited two anthologies of literary criticism and one anthology of creative writing. In 2012, he represented St. Vincent and the Grenadines at the Poetry Parnassus in London. His poems and prose essays have been widely published. He's the author of the CD and book Island Voices from St. Christopher and the Barracudas, published by Papiot Press in 2014. A selection of his prose and poetry, Cano and Sweet, and other pieces, was also published by Papiot Press in 2015. His book, Frontiers of the Caribbean, has been published by Manchester University Press in 2017. Next to me is Rex Dixon. Rex was born in 1939 in London, England. After teaching in the new University of Ulster in Belfast, Northern Ireland for several years, he came to Jamaica in 1985 to teach at the Edna Manley College for the Visual and Performing Arts. He has held numerous one-person exhibitions in Kingston, Port of Spain, and abroad, and his paintings are in the permanent collection of the National Gallery of Jamaica, Wolverhampton Art Gallery, and numerous private collections. He gave up teaching to paint full-time in 1997. His work can be seen at James Ray Gallery in Belfast and Softbox Studios in Port of Spain. Dixon and his wife, Professor Patricia Mohammed, are the authors of the recently published book, Travels with a Husband. Next to me is Annalie Davis. Annalie Davis is a visual artist who works around issues of post-plantation economies by engaging with the landscape of Barbados where she lives. Working at the intersection of biography and history, she has been making and showing her work regionally and internationally since the early 90s. In 2011, Annalie founded Fresh Milk, a socially engaged arts platform and micro-artist residency program on a modern dairy farm, which historically operated as a sugarcane plantation in the 1660s. The farm offers a critical context for her practice, engaging with the residue of the Caribbean plantation through drawings, installations, photographs, objects, and activism. From September 2016 to January 2017, Annelie's solo exhibition curated by Holly Bainu entitled This Ground Beneath My Feet, A Chorus of Bush and Rab Lands, was shown at the Idea Lab, the Warfield Center in Austin, Texas. And to my far right is Mr. Kristen Chen who's a freelance graphic designer who makes books and websites. His clients range from cultural institutions like the National Gallery of the Bahamas to writers and poets like Shivani Ramlachan, Sharon Miller, and Andre Bagu. He graduated in 2010 from Parsons, the new school of design with an associate's degree in applied graphic design and has worked at Macmillan Publishing and Random House in New York. He also holds a master's in public health from Tulane University. He's the co-founder of 1000 Mokos, a stilt walking project, and also Dwen Islands, a publishing project that explores digital literature in the Caribbean. He heads the Toothprints project at Alice Yard and Grandison Lab. This is a side project that explores contemporary graphic design in public spaces. He's currently working on a book with Fet sign painter, Bruce Keone. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Now I've asked each participant to prepare some brief remarks, which we'll use as a context for building our conversation. So if Philip, could you start please and just sort of give us your opening remarks. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Marsha, and to Bocas for inviting me to come, to come back actually, because I was here before some years ago. So um, yeah, my book is called Cano and Sweet and Other Pieces. And it's a collection of, of words and images 
Um, and I was asked to say something about the process of creating the book. Well, very briefly, uh, that process was, is really, I mean, twofold. Um, doing something like that in which one is um, having to combine uh, the work. In my, in my case, there were uh, 15 uh, artists um, <clears throat> who were willing to provide one individual piece uh, of their work. And essentially, the process of creating the book involved two things. One is to work with people that you trust, and the other is basically um, to invite artists whose work seem to talk to the text um, in, in various ways. Um, for me, the aim of doing the collection was simply to create something to give some pleasure both to the reader and to myself. Um, I wanted to make a positive statement about artistic collaboration between artists and writers and um, also within the collection to try to capture a range of different moods because the collection, um, the, there's a long piece called Cano and Sweet and then there are individual poems or prose pieces uh, which were written at different times and so uh, come through different, different sense of feelings and does that. I should say that um, in terms of also in, in the process of creating, I mean, I have to recognize uh, some important contributors to the book. Um, uh, one of the people, for instance, was, is Therese Hatchety, who helped me choose uh, the existing images, and uh, somebody with whom I've co collaborated before uh, when she ran a, a gallery in Barbados, the Zemicon Gallery. Um, I have also to recognize uh, uh, the Polly Patello at the Papillot Press, who is the editor. She, this is the second collection of my work that she's edited. And working with Polly was, was really valuable. I don't think I could really have worked with anybody else in terms of the time and the commitment that she put into helping me put the book together. Um, her designer, a man by the name of Andy Dark, who is based in Wales, uh, also was absolutely instrumental. It's important in doing a book like this uh, for me the, to, I mean, it, it, not just to me, but the, every page basically has to be designed and so it, uh, and we have to, have to work uh, as fully as possible to, to satisfy the artists in terms of the way in which their work was being represented. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, Polly's job there, uh, working with uh, the artists who gave permission. I think I only had one artist refuse to participate in the collection, which was, which was fine. Um, everybody else agreed who, who we approached. And that was uh, also very, very satisfying on the one hand, but on the other, of course, you develop a responsibility to try to present their work uh, as fully as possible and as clearly as possible. And it means things like um, ensuring that each page is, uh, you know, the, 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 the paper, the standard of the paper is just as important as anything else so that the work, work can be presented as, as, as in as good a light as possible. So issues of design become very important. Uh, the, the, the texture and quality of the page, as I said. Um, and so, yeah, so what we, I have in the collection is, is a collection of uh, 12 fine artists, two photographers, and one photo photograph of one piece of sculpture. Um, so basically, that's the background to, the, to, to this collection. Thank you very much, Philip. Rex, could you tell us a little bit about travels with a husband? Sure, yeah. That's the book. Uh, the book is um, at uh, the first bookshop on the right. As you go into the, it's nearly called um, Paper Based Bookshop, you can buy it there. <laughs> um, my wife couldn't get here, unfortunately. Uh, she's stuck in Belize or Miami Airport. Um, and she usually does the talking, so she's put me on the hot seat here, which I'm not very thankful for at all. <laughs> so she's given me some notes, it won't be long. <laughs> Travels with a Husband is a journey about marriage, companionship, and work. An autobiography in prose, verse, and drawings. A travelogue, an adventure in style. 
Pat and I came to the idea of this book for two reasons. First, we have had and continue to have a creative relationship that has been fed by our different impulses. My visual interpretation of place and space and her writing and storytelling. Much of our contemporary life is built not on permanence but on travel and temporary migrations of one sort or another. But the concept of travel in the book is not primarily a literal one. It is very much about time, recollection, encounters of difference and finding oneself. The book covers our life and travels over 20 years since we first met in 1994 in Jamaica. Jamaica and Trinidad are treated more extensively than other countries. The chapters are not in strict chronology of time, but start in Mexico with their first, first trip together and continues through the Netherlands, England, Canada, Namibia, Seville, Japan, Haiti, Australia, Albany in the United States, Cuba for several visits, India where Pat's film Coolie Pink and Green was screened, Barbados and Northern Ireland. The book is a collection of short essays, poems and doggerel verse with drawings by myself that are selected to re represent the road of space and place. So my drawings and paintings have always been an autobiographical feel at t of time and event. As Patsy and I travelled, mainly but not always for her work, I would sometimes send postcards with drawings back to ourselves. This is something I, I got from when I was a, a, a child. We used to go to the seaside once a year for our holidays. No jet travel then. We used to go and we used to either send ourselves back a, a postcard or buy a stick of rock. I don't know if anybody knows what a stick of rock is, but it's a piece of candy with the name of the place written inside it. But <laughs> the postcards, um, I've got some here. I'll, I'll, I'll leave them out and show them to you. Um, yeah, I can talk about them, yeah. Um, I work with ink and water on paper or canvas and, and acrylic flat on the studio floor. And when dry, this would trigger out the ideas or even details that have carried over from events or places we have visited. The book brings together a narrative in both text and image. Just one last paragraph now. The <laughs> The title of the book, by the way, is a homage to two other writers, Travels, Travels with a Donkey by Robert Louis Stevenson. His travels with an obstinate donkey called Modestine through the Cévennes district of France in 1879 and Graham Greene's Travels with My Aunt. We are both reluctant tourists and Patsy likens me with my full collusion to the obstinate Modestine who Stevenson had to put on the way through his journey on foot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rex. Annelie, can you give us some context to this topic? Thanks. Thank you, Marcia, and thanks very much to Nicholas and Marina for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is establish a little bit of a context for my art practice. Um, I'm particularly interested in a very specific piece of landscape, uh, literally the ground beneath my feet, that's located on a, a piece of land in, in the center of Barbados. Um, it, it's currently working as a dairy farm. It was operational from the 1660s as a sugarcane plantation. Uh, part of that first wave of uh, European colonization in the global south that uh, developed this plantation model. And I'm interested in, the, in this landscape as a sort of um, a site of genesis or regeneration. Um, and I'm, I'm working with the, the recent body of work has been engaging with ledger pages, these plantation ledger pages from the 70s and the 80s as, as part of the practice that is examining the plantation and the vestiges of that, that history. Um, responding to that landscape also includes doing work that's looking at um, archaeology, walking these fields that shores up these shards from the late 1700s and early 1800s that are scattered on all of these islands. It's not specific to that location. But looking at these shards and examining them and using them to become uh, part of the work that I'm doing, seeing whether we can develop an archaeological site on that particular landscape that opens up the plantation in a variety of ways. So it happens through archaeology, community programming, uh, fresh milk, which Marcia had mentioned earlier as um, a socially engaged platform that 
offers a micro residency that's open to local, regional, and international artists. These things combine with the artistic practice as a way to sort of unravel that particular site that's obviously very loaded and, and uh, has a, a, a very sort of traumatic uh, history and a long legacy of enslavement and indentureship. But it's looking at what possibilities exist around transformation for that particular site. And so these ledger pages, which are a model of um, logging economic information and a document that was used widely by the British Empire, uh, what I'm attempting to do is to enter alternate information into these uh, substrates or templates that rival a single economic story to to talk about this site. And so there are other kinds of images and narrations and words and numbers um, and, and narratives that enter into that through um, accessing stories from wills and writing and um, family documents. Um, so that's the location out of which I work and it's the environment to which I'm responding. Thank you, Anneli. And Kristen, our designer. Hi, thanks, Marcia. So four years ago, I um, initiated a project called Duane Islands, and I think it's kind of appropriate to be back here because it was a BOCUS event as well. So I, you know, because I was the last minute add-on to this panel, I just pulled the blog post from last year and kind of um, revised it a little bit. So I'll read that to you guys, okay? Duane Islands is a performance, as is the act of reading. It takes place at Alice Yard, the backyard space of the house at Ata Roberts Street, Woodbrook, Port of Spain. This was once the house of Sean Leonard, great, Sean Leonard's great-grandmother. Great Four generations of children played and imagined in this yard, and now we continue this tradition. Alice Yard is a space for creative exper experiment, collaboration, and improvisation. Last year's installation of Duane Island's Kiskadi was not a show, rather an idealized performance full of mistakes, imagination at play. Bocas was just a deadline. Enter Duane Island's Kiskadi, a yard now re reading space. Alice Yard and Avery, as poet bird caller Fanny Capaldeo types and utters in tongues and chirps on her book cover billboard. Her verses punctuated with lush cinemographs taken from the Orinoco Delta by contemporary artist Luis Vasquez La Roche, a Kiskadi on a wire, a moving picture book. All the world's a stage, said Shakespeare. Enter Alice Yard, a reading space, now birdcage, now flutter of pages, where words become lines, become movement of soca contemporary dancer Candace Thompson, who makes her debut in Alice Yard live streamed from a dance studio in Brooklyn, New York, projected onto suspended strips of white cloth layered dancing in the wind. This makes the space soft, calm, and alive. In the way are three cages that float and subtly sway within a box, chalk, and charcoal a pair of slippers in case, a mirror to reflect, and manuscripts to edit. On entering, pages are curtains, and reading is simply a performance. Ahead is the annex, now Orinoco Delta. It drifts behind a steel cage, in silence with mangrove as a horizon. The yard, now a boat, a raft adrift, comes across a Duane Kiskadi, a sporadic animation by creative quasi-shade, Land is reached and Luis transports us back to Vani, who is loud, bold, masked, and omnivorous, drowned out by the sun-drenched silence of the floating delta, and by literary kiskadees perched on the balcony of a Twitter branch outside pruned by the good folk of, a North, of North 11 and malnourished by Rodel Warner. Saturday night and kiskadee night at the, at the yard. Andre Bagu, Alicia Bartels, Peter Christopher, Brianne McIver, Sharon Miller, Shivani Ramachan. A splendid line of poets, writers, the Kiskadees, a wild rumpus and a chatter of call and response. Kiskadees calling, Kiskadees calling, Kiskadees. A beautiful flautist named Marie Martina Chow to accompany the chorus. It's here in Alice Yard where, from my knowledge, everything was done for the first time, browser-based and streamed from the internet, looping videos on YouTube, live streaming with Ustream and Twitter ticker, and tracks from SoundCloud. This marks a new art direction for myself personally as a designer creative coding with processing P5, HTML5, CSS, JavaScript, which treats the web platform as a serious toolkit for designing and creating digital and interactive work from open source software to online collaborations, a medium for Trinidad to unlock. Duane Island's Kiskadi was not a show. 
It was an idealized performance full of mistakes and firsts. A first draft with a yellow feathered chest and gyrations. A stab at global theater, as Marshall McLuhan might call it. In cahoots with Vanny Capaldeo, playtime with Tati. Featuring a Trinidadian cast and a passerine bird, full of imagination and hopeful duende. Many presents, one time, Vanny Capaldeo. Thank you very much, Kristen. I want to get into the conversation by thinking about words and images in some specific formats. The format of the book, as well as exhibition making, and in thinking about it in terms of the digital space, because I know you design websites. Rex, I'd like to start with you. Uh, could you tell me how you and Pat actually put the book together? What was the process of curating memories in image and word form like? Well, it took some time. <laughs> Um, we had 20 years worth of work to look at. Um, so first of all, we broke it down into um, countries. And then I have hundreds and hundreds of drawings, which, I've, which I do and have stored away. So I had to go through all of them to make them fit, mi mi mix the um, writing. So the writing came first, really. Okay. And then the, the drawings came afterwards. Um, but the really serious bit was done by Seaview Graphics. I mean, they designed the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, that, that's the hard part, I think, like Philip was saying. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I can do the images, Pat can do the writing, but it's to, to, to design it is a very, very important mm -hmm. thing. And Seaview Graphics did a wonderful job for us there. It's interesting that you say that the writing came first. Yeah. Why was that important? Talk about that sequencing. Well, I mean, it's it's... It, 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 sometimes we, we, we came together, at like, like Japan, we were only there for um, seven days. I mean, um, so Pat, once she did a conference, I mean, she was jet lagged and horrible, but I could go back to the hotel and sleep. But so had, she had to go through it and meet, meet all these people and professional people. And uh, so in the evening, one evening, we went to the cafe where you sit on the floor, was it with your feet in a little thing? And and there she was fast asleep on the table. So that, was, that was quite funny. And, and the, another time was when we, we, she'd done her performance and we'd gone and had some, um, some, uh, some Japanese food and some wine and we were a bit drunk and we were in the lift to the hotel and there this wonderful couple with a kimono and two little children. They're very, they're very proud people, the Japanese, and they're very polite and they're bowing to us and talking to us. And, Patsy decided that if you put mus after every word, you could sound Japanese. So she was going, Happy Christmas, and I was buying like this. <laughs> so we bowed out of the hotel and left going, Happy Christmas, Happy Christmas. So the, the, books, the books, drawings for Japan are funny because we, we both found it very funny. Uh, but so there, there's, there's not often a connection. I mean, it's, it's, some, it's often it's humor. The book is not meant to be. Um, heavy or verse, so it's really dog wool. It's, um, I mean, I, the, the verses I make are just knocked off in the um, hotel room quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, they're not meant to be serious. Anyway, but. Thank you, Rex. And Philip, for your book, perhaps you can sort of build on what Rex was talking about. You mentioned um, the need to look for affinities, both explicit and sometimes tangential, in terms of thinking about pairing uh, images with your poetry. Can you speak a little bit more about that process in the building of the book? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to do that by um, reading a couple of pieces because one of the things I didn't say is that actually Anna Lee has a piece in the book and, and so does Rex and, and that's kind of important and I missed that out in my anxiety to, to, to tell you all about how wonderful the thing is. Uh, but before I do that, I want to just do a quick um, aside. Think of this like an, like an advertisement um, because one of the things that I do is, is uh, you know, I'm a spoken word person so, and I have, to, I have to tell you a story and this story is about uh, you, you have to look for the images in this uh, in your head um, and this one is about a police station exchange um, and it's between a police woman and um, some uh, there was a bunch of us who were sitting on the bench waiting and then it was the turn of this Rasta gentleman to come up and speak to the police woman and they had this exchange and first the police woman spoke first and then the Rasta spoke first the police woman said next what you want Rasta I name not Rasta. I name King David. Why you want David? 
King David. Why you want King? Want to report a next King David? Why do you? Say you want to kill I and I. You been drinking? I and I doesn't drink. Rasta only smoke hope. Smoke, smoke hope. Go back and sit down. Next. Okay, but uh, this is just the advert. <laughs> um, I wanted to, 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 to talk about two pieces. Um, and I would I'll start with, sorry, three pieces. Um, one which tries to capture um, uh, Barbados uh, at night, um, uh, which is a, a piece uh, that I call, call uh, surprisingly, Barbados at night. Um, it's, it's actually Bridgetown. Uh, and it's a piece which is accompanied by the work of Arthur Atkinson. Uh, which is a piece of, uh, uh, the work is acrylic on canvas. And essentially his images are of a group of men standing around playing dominoes, which is a common urban scene in any Caribbean town. And um, the, piece, the piece plays off uh, the text, which goes something like this. Barbados night. A slow wave curls and breaks between Brighton and Bats Rock on this bold Barbados night. The moon's pale fingernail bunkers down, lost and found, inside bales of wispy cloud. Walk down to the waterfront. Bridgetown bustles. Pavement people blink in the bright lights. Broad street banks watch indifferently as boutiques and department stores ceaselessly push for profits. High on Hansard, bureaucratic stakhanovites work late to steady the ship of state. On this bold Barbados night, boys back from the big city with bucks to burn, flash bright smiles, break off to fuel their banter with more beer. Bertha brandishes her broad beam, bouncing left and right. It's business to bag a brace of customers tonight. Benny's begging on the corner with a sad story about a broken home, a bunch of kids to feed, but he won't take less than a blue $2 bill. Bible-bashing Brother Brooks bellows about baptism and banishing Beelzebub. Somewhere in the distance, an ambulance, plangent as a stricken puppy, parts traffic, burns up the bend, hospital bound. The last bus for Bathsheba, belching black smoke, quits the bus stand, hits the road, as another slow wave curls and breaks between Brighton and Bats Rock on this bold Barbados night. Uh, the piece that Rex did um, is called Lesso Blues. And um, it's, I suppose you could call it a liminal piece. Um, it's actually, I think, my, my reading of it, and Rex will correct, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's a... Um, essentially comes out of the sort of the, the discovery of the Paleolithic cave paintings at, in, at, in Lasso in the Dordogne area. Um, and the, there were three categories of paintings which came, out, came about. Some were of animals, some were <clears throat> uh, human figures, and some were sort, sort of abstract signs. And um, I think it was in terms of the abstract signs because of the, the abstract piece that, that, that Rex uh, uh, had painted, gave, seemed to fit very well with the tone of this short piece called The Note, um, in which um, the paintings, the abstract paintings seem to be done in a sort of trance. And I was, what I was trying to do, I'm trying to do, is capture the trance of the jazz musician. And it's in the piece, and it's called The Note. Sometimes there is a moment in a gig when you reach for a note and hold it, the audience is with you. The band, razor sharp, everyone in the mood. At that moment, you forget the $150 you owe Milt, the crazy drummer, the tenement rats where you live. You forget that you are holding your saxophone, that life is too short. And in that moment, you fool yourself that Georgia will always be there the whole night through, and you want the note to last forever. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, 
Anneli, you worked with uh, curator Holly Biner to produce your recent solo show. Could you tell us about the curatorial decisions that you were made, made for that show because it included a reading room, uh, interviews, drawings, and other components? So the, um, the exhibition called This Ground Beneath My Feet, A Chorus of Bush and Rab Lands, uh, is what the, the publication mm -hmm. comes out of that, um, co-curated curated by Holly. Um, it was, we were invited to show the work in Austin, Texas. And so we felt that we were advised that there would not be a sort of great understanding for the context out of which the work was coming. And so we saw it as an opportunity to provide a context by providing a reading room with a particular reading list that people could access. Um, there was a, a discursive project called White Creole Conversations that was available on a monitor in the exhibition space, uh, a series of drawings, and then the texts were important. They were coming from various perspectives. Um, so Marcia was one of the people that contributed to the catalog. Um, Evelyn O'Callaghan, who is here, who's a professor of literature, brought a, a different perspective. Andal Gosain, who um, is a prof an associate professor at York, but has a background in ecology, and David Knight, Jr. So there were very different voices that were coming in to kind of create a larger understanding of where this work was coming from. Um, and in addition to that, there was a piece called um, Bush Tea Services, uh, and there was a performative um, element that was part of a panel conversation. Um, and we also had Eddie Chambers, who's a professor at the university there, who then responded to the body of work by curating a series of books out of the library at the University of Austin, at Texas at Austin, that responded to the body of work. So we were really trying to create a fuller context for, for the body of work. Why was the reading room important, an important component of the exhibition? Well, in speaking with the professors there, uh, we also had a full program allowing us to engage with professors and students. Mm -hmm. There was a sense that if this work coming out of this sort of post-plantation space, that a lot of the student body there would be familiar with the plantation as an American Southern experience, and their reading of the Caribbean would be you know, read through the lens of an escape or a, a tourist destination. Um, so the reading room was providing through books that were speaking about literature and politics and history and, um, and art a way to also access some of the ideas that w were being sort of dealt with in the so body of work. So writers from within, from within the, the region? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Annelie. And Kristen, I want to talk a little bit about technology which is transforming the way we seek and receive information. And it's argued that we have less and less time for deep reading. How do you see the relationship between words and images when designing for the digital domain? It's tricky. Um, I think the whole Duane Islands actually came out of that question because it is this challenge of how do you balance reading in our everyday lives and I mean, when you come down to 140 characters in a tweet, you know, you're getting really close to like just a, a syllable, a grunt almost of communication. Right. And then how does that affect how we interact on a you know, regular basis? And I think, I mean, actually the, you know, technology changes how we behave, but there's also, I mean, these phases in which we go into. And I think part of, you know, this kind of immense compression of communication also has the opposite effect as well. So after you spend a lot of time communicating in these short kind of um, utterances, there is also um, the, the opposite pendulum swing to, I think, the yearning for deep reading, the yearning for substance, the yearning for, you know, books again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I mean, I think there was a phase where I went through where, yeah, print is kind of going to die out. But I mean, there is a place as well, too, where I think there is a certain longing for something more meaningful, and I think people will seek that out. Um, and a lot of it has to do, I think, with how you design the experience. So, I mean, the Dwayne Islands really is this question of what is reading? Um, it was interesting to see some of the guys in the, um, the crowd here kind of closing their eyes while the poem is being read. And is that a form of reading where you kind of listen and you absorb and you, you, know, you, you listen, right? And I think the Dwayne Islands, with the technology, you also have this chance to experiment. And I think a lot of us don't know what we're doing, and I think that's also okay to, to confess that there is um, this playing around, but we are trying to figure out what is the best experience 
to take in more deep breathing, you know, things that have more substance to it, um, hear voices, have opinions, and be able to communicate that on a larger scale. There's a lot, I think, that, you know, technology kind of um, takes away, but it also gives a lot of opportunities to be able to um, add to the experience. Right. Thank you, Kristen. Rex. <laughs> Rex, you spoke about, well, you mentioned verses in your book, and I know that along with the paintings, you wrote verses uh, that are published in the book. Could you tell me what do you see as the similarities and differences in the construction of a painting and the writing of verse? Um, well, I've got an example here, if anyone wants to see it, it's a collage book which has got text and an image. I make, this is a book of mine. So I, I do the collage and I make, it's a pity we haven't got a slide, you see I can't see anything visual, we're talking about visuals, but this is, Pat, this is Patsy being a, having a hair braid in Africa and this is the text. It's, so I think it, perhaps someone would like to take it around. <laughs> <laughs> And this is another book here, which is um, Casabon's Reproductions. I've, what I've done is I've, I've written on the front page here. Um, drawings by M. J. Casabon, 1857, with some verses that Rex wrote at various times and places with Pat Mohammed in 2004. So what I've done is I've taken the, um, the man and, and wrote over his stuff. So I've amended Casabon. <laughs> because one of the pictures is, is actually of my studio, the St. Joseph River. He drew the river where my studio is. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of continuity. So, but in, inside the drawings, there's like text, mm -hmm. drawings of paper and so you really need to see them, really. I mean... Uh, but something like this. this what's, it, what's this one called? What's this one called? Going to Going London to Zoo. London. Is this, there a different kind of thinking process involved in, in coming up with this versus... No, it's, it's come from the unconscious. I mean, this was... I've got two children all grown up. One's in London. Uh, he's, he lives on the streets and he goes to prison and he's a drug addict. And I can occasionally go and see him. I just wrote this after going to see him. Malcolm, Pat, me and Gru went to see the lions in the zoo. We went by train and by bus. We never even made a fuss. When we had to change at Elephant and Castle, though the drunks did make us startle, with their shouting and their swearing and their cans of lager bearing, because we were going to the zoo. And so we walked in two by two. And when closing time at nearly dusk, it was only Pat and me who caught the bus. Had to leave poor called Grew in London. Mm -hmm. So, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're arguing for that they're both intuitive processes. Yeah, they just, they just come. Um, the, the drawing and the painting come. You, you, you don't think about it. You don't, you don't illustrate it. It's, it's purely on the floor. You, you, it comes, the image come, it comes to you. So it's, it's intuitive. But perhaps someone would come like to take that book and there's more here. Okay. There's, uh, there's more drawings in here as we well. There's, there's the them. postcards. They're all in here. We'll talk about the postcards. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Annalie, you mentioned earlier about, you know, working with ledgers. And I know that with this last show, it, there was this amalgam of plantation playlists and a will that granted manumission uh, for a slave and that you combine those with images. Could you talk about the kinds of dialogues that you were facilitating by making these kinds of connections? So one of the um, starting points for some of this work is a will from 1816, which is on the, on the cover of the, of the catalog and also inside. Um, and it's a will written by Thomas Applewit, who was the owner of Walker's plantation, which is the site where I now live. Um, and in it, he, he names um, six enslaved women. One he, he refers to as his um, favorite slave girl. <clears throat> Her name is Frances. And so I was 
kind of struck by the naming of these women who lived and worked on, on that site where, where I had lived and worked. And so it, it was a matter of really sort of transcribing that will and those words became part of the text. And then um, using the shards that I have been finding in the fields where I walk was another way of trying to create some kind of uh, visibility for so much that's not visible. So marking Francis's name, the letters of her name, using shards across these ledger pages, because of course most of the information we have is from the voice of the white male planter. Uh, it's difficult to understand why she's listed as his favorite girl slave. Was she, uh, you know, a child or a concubine? But there's all these fragments. So there was an attempt at using these fragments that were sort of turning up in the fields all the time as, as a way to then make a link between the fragments, the text in the will, and the drawings on these ledger pages that have very straight, obviously, lines that try to tell a very single kind of economic story and to sort of interrupt that and to create these interventions uh, with words and images onto this substrate. So are, you proposing, uh, are you proposing word and images? together as a way of sort of heightening visibility. You talk about being able to make certain things visible or legible. Yeah, and also trying to, you know, challenge this, you know, sort of single economic story that we're all very familiar with, you know. The, the information that's entered in these ledger pages is, is about numbers and tonnage and, and the price per ton. You know, this is why we had influence in the House of Commons. And, but there are so many other stories that, that haven't been unraveled. So it's an attempt to create a space yes. for that to happen. Okay, thank you. Kristen, hmm. I was very excited when I, you, you had written, I came across something that you wrote online about the website that you did for Sharon Miller. And you spoke about using her short stories to inform the imaging or the visual aesthetic for that website. Could you tell us a little bit about that, that process? Sure. Um, so Shara Miller is um, a Trinidadian author. She came out with a book called The Whale House, um, a collection of short stories. It was two years ago, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a great project because, again, it, was, um, it came out of a collaboration from the Duane Islands where she read for us. And so I got to have a relationship with her and find, you know, and just experience her work on a more deeper level. Um, the thing with, I would say, the words and image, um, there's a great quote. So Marshall McLuhan, he's um, a media kind of um, pioneer. And one of his things that he talks about is the levels of um, communication. So he talks about color registering first with viewers. He talks about signs and symbols registering second, and words registering third. and. Um, a lot of work that, um, that Sharon puts out has to do with the landscape. If you read all of her short stories, there's this deep dive into the Trinidadian landscape. And a big part of that, I, I mean, is also because I think she, her, her stories are an attempt as well to kind of rewrite how Trinidadian stories are written. So to kind of look you know, to the colonial gaze coming down and how does the Caribbean want to reflect itself. So when we talk about the landscape, that's something we, have, we all have access to. And her stories, go straight into that. And a big part of the landscape, when we experience it as Trinidadians, has to do with the color. So the color was something that we wanted to get right. You know, what is, when you say Trinidad, the color? Is it the Caribbean blue that, you know, we kind of get represented in the postcards? Or is it the Caroni green, that brownish kind of tinge, yellowish, you know, sunburst um, green? And that was what, something that we kind of struck upon when we were working together was, what is the imagery? What is the color that we want to kind of represent her work? What is it you feel? You know, that color has a feeling as well, too, when you read her work. And so luckily, we are in the network of creative collaborators. And so Nadia Huggins is a photographer who is um, from St. Vincent. But she was um, working here um, for a little while. And she had done some work um, in Trinidad. So she had captured a, um, a lot of, like a lot of her work is mostly under, underwater. So she had all of these great imagery of, I think, over by Macri, and you have that kind of brackish. It's not, you know, transparent. There's a lot of, mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lack of transparency, actually. And, and I think for any Trinidadian who's experienced going down the islands or driving on the North Coast, there is um, a certain connection when you kind of see and you read and you feel, you know, what Sharon is feeling when you read her work. So, I mean, a lot, a lot that, that site in particular had a lot to do with um, color. Yes. Yeah. Thanks very much for that, Kristen. Uh, Philip, you spoke a little bit about um, abstract 
paintings in your book, and you, you referenced uh, Rex's work in particular. Um, and I wonder if you can talk about um, figurative versus abstract work or representational versus abstract work. Do you see them working differently in the way they interact with the poetry in your book? Is one more illustrative than the other? Or do they both extend and transform your poetry? Um, well, I, I hope it's more like an interchange, really, between the two. Um, I, I think um, I have to say that, that I, I am not a formally trained artist. So um, for me, very much it, it's to do with, um, for example, there's a, a one piece which is a, a, a number of different colors. And I, I know for, that for some people, um, certain colors, certain words have, they imagine a color as soon as you say that word. It's, it's not unusual for people to do that. And so hopefully, you know, there, there's, there's an interchange working between, you know, a particular word and, and that band of color that, that's in, on the page. Um, so at, uh, at one level, that, that's how it would operate. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, it's, it's as much uh, also uh, a response perhaps in those cases sometimes to the title uh, and the title picking up both in terms of the, uh, the, the work and, uh, and, and the text. So um, I, yeah, it's, uh, I wanted to, 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 to get a, a sort of a flow and to create a mood and I think color just is just as if not more powerful in terms of creating a mood. I mean, one of the issues that arises, I think, with this sort of work is that I think um, the, uh, it's, uh, the danger, the fear, is, in a way, is that you know, one is drawn immediately to the image much more strongly than one is drawn to the text. Mm -hmm. And so the text has to try to, to catch up with the image because people's eye uh, is very quickly move in, in that direction. Mm -hmm. So what you're kind of, so there is a, there is a risk for both both, both people, but I think um, you know you, you, you have to hope that um, that it 's not just a, a negative thing, but they 're both both are gaining from the combination I like that you 're talking about the idea of you know being drawn into the image first and then going to the text, but there is this possibility opportunity for traveling back and forth between the image and the text, which yes. I think is what happens as well um, in Rex and Pat's book, I mean, in Travels with a Husband. It's also an invitation to travel to these two spaces. And I mean, that, I I'd like to, if you can pick up on that and to talk about your postcards. Because, um, in this as well, I mean, this, this, this cover photograph, um, which, you, which you can see at Softbox Gallery, Alcazar Street, can't you, Nisha? Is it still there? It's, it's on the wall. Well, this is a, this is a small, and this is, it's much, this is about seven foot across. Mm -hmm. uh, this painting I did in Jamaica in about 1998 after I'd done two trips to Namibia with Patsy. And the painting is called The Wild Beast I Never Saw in Namibia. <laughs> because yeah, after I'd been there, I was thinking about it and I couldn't, I didn't want to do a tourist painting. I didn't want to do something that talked about the uh, the greenness of the Trinidad landscape or whatever. So what I was thinking about was the comics I used to read as a kid in England called, um, well, all sorts of comics, and Tarzan especially, I remember the Tarzan comics. So in, in this painting, there's like a three foot high Indian midget, a giraffe with a human face. There's all sorts of things in it, but it's certainly not Namibia. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that's one way. Also talking about the abstract painting in this, there's abstract paintings in here, which are just pure color, mm -hmm. you know, like th this one for the Barbados. I mean, you need to buy the book, honestly. You can't see <laughs> 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 Really need to. Um, postcards. Uh, well, I've got some postcards here. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass we'll them pass around. Pass them around, yes. The, 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 and we'll get in. We'll yeah. leave it for the Q&A. Yeah, because, because what happened was I'd send the postcards, I'd be wherever, maybe Australia, Japan, and I'd be stuck in a hotel room, Patsy's doing a gig, you know, university. So I have to go out in the foreign language, buy the, news, buy the postcard, find out where the stamps are, do a drawing on it, put the address, put it in the mail, and it won't come back to, we get back before the postcard comes. So the postcard has gone on the trip as well. 
This postcard's gone around the world much further than me. And sometimes I never came back at all. I had some wonderful ones in Cuba, postcards of um, Fidel talking to Ernest Hemingway and uh, Che Guevara, wonderful black and white photographs. I did about six of his wonderful drawings on. Went to this big hotel in, in Havana, posted them, never saw them again. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you must see yes, them. Let's they're, they're pass here. them around. Yeah, here, here. Thank you very much. We're going to pass those around, and I want to open the floor for conversation. There's an opportunity so to talk to Annalie and to Kristen about the catalog that they worked on together for her solo show. So are there any questions from the floor? I wanted to say something about what Annalise said before. Sure. Would that I could, I could have, would that I could have that kind of devastating effect on my readers that I have on microphones. <laughs> um, I live in Barbados myself, and uh, unless you've done it, it's it's hard to understand how much of uh, history is present in modern Trinidad. When you walk into those cane fields and you lose any sound, any engine sounds and you come through the cane and see an old plantation house, it sends shivers down your spine. It's like walking into 12 years a slave. It's, it's really quite amazing. So I'm very struck by the notion of picking out the name of a forgotten person in shards that you found on these fields. I just want to say that. I also wanted to mention that, um, which I didn't have an opportunity to speak before, but with the um, end of the sugar industry, which is literally on its last leg, m most of the cane fields have been left uh, abandoned. And what's been interesting is that there's this sort of apothecary, what I refer to as a quiet revolution that's coming out of the fields where these wild plants are asserting themselves. So in addition to the shards, there are these wild plants that would have been used initially by the enslaved and the indentured as uh, for bush tea. Um, and it's interesting to know that for the first time since the late 17th century, we have now the highest biodiversity on the island, which is, you know, in, in different to this imposition of a monoculture on the entire landscape. So it's these wild plants and the shards that are kind of asserting their presence at the moment. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or comments? Can we get a mic? Thank you very much. Um, and everyone on the panel, thank you very much for your presentations. And my question is for Annalie again. Um, and, and like Basil, I, I have, I do, I'm a Barbadian and live there. And really struck by the presence of that history always, not just in the cane fields, but if you go to the East Coast and you look, you, look, you, you feel well, Africa is the next place there. So it's, it's really all around you. But it's not necessarily all around us in our head in the same way. And so I was, I'm really curious about your experimentation with the dialogue amongst white Barbadians to sort of excavate their sense of this history and how they live with it. So can you tell us a little bit about that? So that, that work is called White Creole Conversations. Um, there's a lot of awkwardness, I think, around speaking about whiteness. And I think there's a kind of a homogenous understanding of what whiteness is in the Caribbean, that there's a single way to be white. Um, and so I thought that it, it might be of value to begin to start. I mean, there are no answers in any of this. It's just trying to open up a space for a conversation to happen about what it means to be a white Creole person in Barbados. But then it kind of grew and people around the Caribbean and in the diaspora wanted to respond. So it's a combination of recorded um, audio files that are available, one-on-one um, -on -one conversations where there are a series of questions with people 
trying to unpack what it means to be white in the 21st century. Um, and there are a number of writers from around the Caribbean and the diaspora who've contributed ideas to that. I think it's very incomplete. Um, I think a lot of people are find the word Creole, it's obviously a complicated word. Uh, a lot of white Caribbean people are uncomfortable with the use of that term and they don't want to use it. Um, it has very different readings in Texas where people feel that you use the term Creole to distance yourself from blackness. Um, you know, there's, so it's a complicated kind of term. It's not used in the US Virgin Islands. They speak about being continental. Um, and I think that that project needs to grow. It's, it's, um, it's, it's something that I think I've just started the very beginning of. Any more questions from the floor? No? Oh, one more, ready to wrap up? Thanks, oops. I'm interested in that contested use of Creole because in other parts of the Caribbean, Creole tends to have a more positive association, especially with language and um, you know food and this kind of thing. So I wondered if you could talk a bit more about why some white Caribbean people don't want to be called Creole. I suppose it has to do with feeling tainted in a way and I and I and I you know there are conversations happening now it seems more than ever or maybe not more than ever but the sense of purity and wanting to retain a sense of purity um, and and I think that that the term functions quite differently. Um, it, I think it works differently in Trinidad. It's not used very often in Barbados. Um, it's a term that I used um, to, to create space. I thought it was a term that would open up space and open up conversation and speak about hybridity. And um, I mean, Marsha mentions this. I don't know if you want to speak about that in your, in your text in here about glissants, you know, the relation to the... I know. Yeah, um, we have to wrap up, unfortunately. I'm getting the cue that <laughs> no, no, we need to wrap up. But yes, there is this idea of... Um, Gleason talking about this this openness um, and using the idea of um, this network or this this stitching together because your piece one of your visual pieces and unfortunately we don't we don't have it here um, refers you look at a piece of lace a particular kind of lace and Gleason also uses that metaphor to talk about this this kind of openness and this possibility for connections and relations um, through that particular imagery right. yeah so that's very key. But just to be sure that people understand that Kristen is actually the designer of this. It yes. began as an e-publication and the Warfield Center loved the, the design so much that they, want, they put it to print. And we worked very closely together with Kristen to do this publication. <laughs> I think there, if there are any, sorry Kristen. Oh, you want to add, okay. With the word and image theme as well too, I think there's a large set of, I mean, amount of work that writers as well have to start doing with the word Creole. Mm -hmm. I think as um, a graphic designer, you, I, I like to start with words as my kind of, um, my initial space where I think the better content, the, you know, the more interesting designs um, come out of good words. So like I try to associate myself with good writers, but um, maybe I, it is that, I think there is a certain, maybe it's a blackness around the word Creole that still hasn't made its way into, I mean, with Annalie expanding the research around it, I think there is um, the molding of language. And I mean, we, it's still, a still young language, I think that's what a lot of us forget, is that we, we, we can write into that narrative as well. Um, so, I mean, I hope that answers a little bit of what you, I mean, I mean yeah, words in general, when you, when you say one word, the word mother to me, I have a different image in my mind than the word mother to you, and so that, you know, kind of separation as well to not sharing a certain history or experience um, creates visuals in our mind as we read. Um, I think that's the power of words as well too. It has an openness, a certain democracy as well that goes beyond just artwork and pictures and imagery is um, the meaning that we have associated with the words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Kristen. I think one of the takeaways from uh, our conversation today is that for us to think about words and images together, that they create a whole that is greater than the sum of their parts. I would like to thank Kristen, Annalie, Rex, and Philip uh, for their time and their thoughts today. And I'd like you to join me in expressing gratitude by giving them a round of applause. <laughs>